it's such a delight to be here, even in the midst of this crazy COVID season. Um, I'm so thankful to Jeff and Heather for the warm hospitality from the Henry Center and from the Divinity School. It's a joy to be with you all today. Over the centuries, many have taken Augustine's teaching on God's grace and our willing, which famously emphasized human bondage to sin and the necessity of God's grace and initiative for us to turn to God in love, to entail that choosing the good is not up to us at all, and that we might as well throw up our hands in despair. Augustinian theology, so this line of thinking goes, breeds complacency, inviting Christians to sin all the more that grace might abound. This was precisely the concern of some monks from Hadramedum whose monastery broke out in a dispute about Augustine's theology in the Bishop of Hippo's own day. If God is responsible for our good willing, they asked, on what basis should we bother rebuking anyone for bad deeds or exhorting anyone to do good ones? Augustine defends the compatibility of his doctrine of grace with exhortation in the late work, Rebuke and Grace. Yet it is one thing to argue that exhortation has a place in the Christian life, and another actually to exhort Christians. Augustine's sermons, as we will see, showcase his work in the latter mode of actual exhortation. In Augustine's preaching, in which he interprets scripture with and for the faithful, day in, day out, year in, year out, we see how a high Augustinian theology of grace hits the rocky ground of everyday Christian discipleship. The following lecture focuses on how Augustine's sermons treat the matter of God's grace and our willing in the context of the Christian life in particular. In the larger panorama of the story of God's impact on the human will, the Christian life this side of paradise, however long and winding its path may seem in the moment, stands only as a way station, not as the destination. Yet Augustine predicts for our brief sojourn here a stunning longevity of effect. It can never be entirely forgotten or fully left behind, even when its struggles have faded to painless memory. Willing in the Christian life of this world will matter in the future, according to Augustine, and it certainly mattered existentially in the day-to-day -day life of his flock. These facts make it unsurprising that Augustine returned so often to this theme in his preaching. In considering Augustine's teaching on the Christian's willing in this life as developed in his preaching, we will first examine Augustine's realism, his assessment of the challenges of willing rightly and the limits of what we can achieve this side of paradise. We will then consider the more idealistic side of his preaching about willing by God's grace. What prospects of growth and encouragement does he hold out? Through this investigation, we will find Augustine uniting an unflinching acknowledgement of human frailty with an ambitious vision of the good willing Christians can achieve with the aid of grace. As Augustine interprets the Bible in the act of preaching then, he develops in the mode of exhortation, a chastened yet demanding vision of graced willing for the Christian life. For Augustine, right willing in this life is not just one aspect of a Christian's calling, but can serve as a basic description of what it means to be a disciple or follower of Jesus. In a sermon explicating Jesus' statement in Matthew 16, 24, that anyone wishing to become his disciple should deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow him, Augustine explains that to deny oneself is to refrain from doing one's own will to do Christ's instead. In commending such a practice, Augustine is not out to promote self-squelching, 
but a path of transformation of will from captivity to the illusion of autonomy to liberation for genuine love of self, others, and ultimately God. To what degree is this kind of transformation, a transformation at the heart of Christian discipleship, possible in this life? And what does it look like? In considering what light Augustine's sermons shed on these questions, we will begin with his diagnosis of the limits and struggles that willing in this life entails, even given God's gracious assistance. First, Augustine observes that in this life, Christians will regularly experience the desire to sin right alongside their will to obey God's commands. According to Augustine's mature interpretation of Romans 7, Paul's will as a follower of Christ was praising the law and consenting to it, yet even so he experienced lust for evil. As much as we might hope to be able to rise above this kind of temptation, Augustine makes clear that perfection in the sense of immunity to wrongful desires in this life is not just rare, it's impossible. In one sermon, he registers this point with a rhetorical question. What would you like, I mean, that there should be absolutely no lusts at all for evil and unlawful delights? Which of the saints wouldn't like that? But none achieve it. As long as you are living here, this is not fulfilled." End quote. Augustine supports his stark assessment with biblical evidence. Commenting on Paul's injunction in Romans 6.12, let not sin reign in your mortal bodies. He observes, he didn't say don't have bad desires. How, after all, can I avoid having bad desires in this mortal flesh, end quote. Paul's command not to let, let sin reign presupposes that sinful desires persist. In Augustine's homiletical imagination, Lusts of the flesh are so active and influential that they seem to take on a kind of momentum and intentional force of their own. Augustine personifies them. Quote, they don't allow you to achieve what you want. Don't allow them to achieve what they want. Don't let them do what they would that you should carry through their work. If they don't give way totally to you, don't you give way either. First, you must square up to the battle in order eventually to gain the victory. Right willing as a Christian involves continually fighting off lusts of the flesh, which in Augustine's view, have a way of taking on a will of their own. Rather than blaming his congregation for their wayward desires, Augustine urges them to focus their energy on not consenting to the bad desires they will inevitably experience. In addition to diagnosing the problem of experiencing desires that rebel against the good we will to do, Augustine commonly describes in his preaching the reality of a disconnect or even a tension between what we will and what God wills. Sometimes the lack of alignment signals something for which we are culpable. In one sermon, for example, he speculates that lack of response to the open preaching of the gospel helps to explain why things are worse in current times than previously. In Augustine's view, it's not only the non-believers who are the problem. Also outrageous is the fact that even the Lord's servants fail to obey his clear teaching. In Matthew 6.20, for example, Jesus instructs people to store up treasure in heaven. Yet Christians are busy as ever, storing up treasures on earth, even though, quote, you are well aware of your Lord's wishes, end quote. In such cases, our willing should be aligned with the Lord's willing, as explicitly expressed in Scripture, and we are culpable for the discrepancy. In other cases, however, lack of alignment is morally acceptable. A concrete illustration Augustine provides in his preaching of such a situation is the regret many feel at the woes and tragedies Rome has recently endured. Given its occurrence, Augustine assumes, the sack of Rome must have been God's will, 
Yet, Augustine neither censures nor consigns to divine censure his imagined dialogue partner who, quote, didn't want Rome to suffer such dreadful things. In the case of this mismatch between divine and human willing, rather than condemning his interlocutor for what she wants, he exhorts her not to condemn God for what God wants. Quote, we can pardon you for not wanting it. Don't you be angry with God because he did want it. He doesn't condemn you for your I don't want it. And are you going to reproach his I do? In this specific case, Augustine seems to find it perfectly acceptable that human and divine willing are at odds. On what basis can Augustine regard this deviation of human willing from God's will with such equanimity? More than once, he appeals to the precedents established by Peter and Christ himself. In preaching the need for patience in bearing with what God wants, Augustine turns to Jesus in Gethsemane as the model. Quote, observe the Lord, observe your head, observe the model of your life. Father, if it may be so, let this cup pass from me. How perfectly he shows his human will and straight away turns his resistance into obedience. However, not what I wish, but what you wish, Father. End quote. Similarly, Augustine points to Peter's example of a will in tension with God's will, quoting John 21, 18. When you are old, another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. Augustine observes, he indicated in him, too, the human will as it shrinks from death. Does it mean because he didn't wish to die that he didn't wish to receive the crown? Preaching to his congregation, Augustine connects the struggles of these paragons of the faith with painful but all too mundane scenarios that some have experienced. Fear of losing a spouse, fear of dying before a spouse, losing a child to death. In each of these instances, according to Augustine, our will's conflict with God's stems simply from how we were created as human beings, namely, as he explains in another sermon, to love being alive and not to want to die. The reality of human willing in the Christian life of this world is that our willing often fails to align with God's, whether because of conscious, blameworthy disobedience or because of our inalienable will endowed by our Creator for a stable, abiding, and inviolable life. Another challenge of willing rightly in this life that Augustine addresses in his sermons is that often we will, not in the end, the natural good of our preservation, but to avoid some experience that God has orchestrated precisely to bless us. Augustine frequently introduces the image of a physician in his homilies to demonstrate how it might be possible for something we will vehemently to avoid to be just what is necessary for our benefit. Augustine compares this situation to a doctor prescribing an unpleasant course of treatment. Quote, how much doctors do against the will of their patients, and yet they are not doing it against their health. To illustrate, Augustine uses a drastic case, amputation. But he applies this fairly extreme scenario of healing through unwanted means to apparently live issues in his congregation, such as the loss of assets, asking, and won't you allow God to cut, to slice off some of your profits, if by such a check you may have a lesson to learn? Even in situations of painful loss, we should not assume that God does not love us if he does not give us what we will. Augustine encourages his congregation in these words. You shouldn't be disheartened when you ask and don't receive and conclude that God hasn't got you in mind. The doctor, after all, doesn't always pay attention to the patient's wishes, although he is undoubtedly attending to his health and aiming at it. He doesn't give what the patient asks for, but he is attending to what he doesn't ask for. He asks for ice cream. He doesn't give it. Has he turned out cruel, the one who came to cure? It's his skill, not his cruelty. 
cases such as these, uh, where our willing of something that seems good and God's will of what actually is good for us are disparate, can prove difficult to identify without the benefit of hindsight. But Augustine recommends that in such situations we adjust ourselves to God's will, or in terms he repeatedly uses, that we accommodate our will to God's as a short-term strategy. For the time being, he says, accommodate yourself to the will of the Lord your God. Perhaps he, uh, th that is a servant of God who becomes God's friend, will also learn his Lord's plans. Meanwhile, before he knows the plans, let him willingly carry out the decisions." End quote. Augustine exhorts his listeners to trust that their creator knows how to set in order what he has created and to commit themselves to God's care. Quote, so he knows what to do. Let's leave him to it. Let's just hand ourselves over to be cured. Let's not give the doctor advice, end quote. Rather than lobbying God to come up with a different treatment plan, our job is to follow God's expert medical counsel. Reassuringly, Augustine preaches not only that we may experience God and God's care when we finally fully accommodate our wills to God, but also that God may be near even in the meantime when we are in the very act of asking God to do something that God doesn't do. Often God is present and at work just at those times when we perceive God not to be doing what we deem best. Preaching on Isaiah 58, 9, while you are still speaking, I will say, look, here I am, Augustine observes, but God is here even when he puts off helping, and he is here because he puts off helping, and he is here by putting off helping. He doesn't want to carry out your hasty and impatient wishes and thereby fail to bring about your complete restoration to health. Sometimes, even as God fails to respond to our requests, God is saying, look, here I am, says Augustine. God is present and active exactly in those moments when we hear only silence and search in vain for a response. When preaching about right willing, Augustine often quotes the reference in Luke 2.14 to peace on earth and goodwill. But Augustine's sermons make clear that Christians should hardly expect constantly calm inner states as they seek to will rightly in this life. Quite to the contrary, Augustine preaches, conflict is a sign of health. In one sermon, for example, it is what he calls the opponent of grace who denies that repeated conflict of will characterizes the life of a Christian. Augustine, however, tells his flock that Paul's description of internal turmoil in Romans 7 describes normal Christian life. Following Christ in the here and now will not bring immediate, imperturbable inner peace. Discord, tension, and struggle are the norm. In fact, they stand as signposts of progress, as labor pains which augur new life and spiritual productivity. What does this look like concretely? Preaching on Luke 12, 58 to 59, which recommends reconciling with one's adversary on the way to court, Augustine introduces a striking idea. He calls God's word the adversary of your will. If you sin, Augustine tells his congregation, quote, your adversary is God's word. For example, perhaps you enjoy getting drunk. It says to you, don't. You enjoy watching the games and vain pastimes. It says to you, don't. You enjoy committing adultery. God's word says to you, don't. In whatever kinds of sin you want to do your will, it says to you, don't. It's the adversary of your will until it can become the author of your salvation. Oh, what a good adversary, what a useful adversary, end quote. Of course, the point is that God's word should not remain our adversary, but that we should reconcile with it. 
At the same time, we should both expect and welcome regular confrontation between God's word and our willing, since this kind of conflict alerts us that change is necessary. Augustine is well aware that some of his listeners may object to such an agonistic outlook on the Christian life. In another one of many instances in which he draws on Romans 7, Augustine introduces an imagined interlocutor who questions whether Paul genuinely wanted the good, given that he didn't choose it. Augustine not only comes to Paul's defense, making the case that it really is possible to want the right thing without being able to do it, but also turns this skeptical question back on his conversation partner. The imagined interlocutor says to Paul, quote, come off it if you wanted to you would do it. It's because you don't want to that you don't do good. To this opponent of grace, Augustine responds, quote, well, if there's nothing in you resisting something else, consider where you as a whole must be. If your spirit has no disagreement with the flesh lusting against it, consider that perhaps your whole mind may be in agreement with the flesh. Consider that the reason why there is no war may perhaps be that there is an unwholesome sort of peace. Perhaps you are in total agreement with the flesh, and so there is no brawling going on. What hope have you got of being able to win eventually if you haven't yet even started to fight?" End quote. When it comes to right willing in this life, Augustine's preaching suggests, we cannot expect only ease and harmony. To the contrary, Augustine warns that the absence of internal conflict may indicate what modern readers might describe as a lack of self-awareness, a naive tranquility stemming from a sinister ignorance of who one truly is and what one is actually doing. Perfect peace may indicate a thoroughgoing surrender to the flesh. Augustine is well aware of the discomfort inner conflict can cause. In one sermon, he explicitly exclaims about Paul, notice how hard he finds the struggle. But for struggles to cease entirely, we must wait for the eschaton. Augustine's honest presentation of the difficulty of willing rightly in this life, taken alone, does not provide a complete picture of how he exhorts his flock to good willing in his preaching. In addition to underlining the arduous nature of willing rightly as a follower of Christ and the many impediments Christians must face, Augustine also sets forth high ideals for human willing empowered by grace. Augustine's preaching on Christ's easy yoke is a prime example of the more hopeful side of his account of right willing in this life. The way to keep your will in the grace of the Lord, as he expresses it, is to follow the guidance and direction of Christ, to take up his yoke. This yoke, Augustine observes, has some very unusual features. He says, have you really taken this yoke? Do you feel you have a rider on your back? Do you feel you have a driver? Then say to him, direct my steps according to your word. He directs you under his yoke and under his burden for his burden to be light for you and his yoke easy. He himself inspired you with love. It's easy and comfortable for one who loves. In Augustine's vivid imagery, Christians bear not only Christ's yoke, but his full body weight upon their backs. But even under this burden, they experience delight, joy, ease, insofar as they are not being subjugated involuntarily, but carrying with them what they love. Commenting in another sermon on Matthew 11, 28 through 30, my yoke is easy, my burden light, Augustine offers a similarly bright prognosis. Thanks to God's loving plan of salvation, whereby we are now under grace rather than under the law, 
we have been filled with the theological virtues. Thus fortified by grace, we can endure hardships without being shaken. Augustine explains, quote, thanks to the ease conferred by simple faith and good hope and holy charity, whatever vexations that prince who has been cast out may inflict from the outside on the outer self become for the inner self light with an inner joy. Nothing is so easy, you see, for a good will as it is for itself. And that's enough for God. Here we have the homiletical complement or counterpart to what Augustine says about the continual struggle of flesh and spirit that characterize human willing in this life. Already, amidst the present contest, the good spiritual gifts of joy and even the added blessings of comfort and ease can be ours as we will the good. In this sense, willing rightly is easy. Corresponding to the lightness of the load of good willing due to love is a lightness of the load due to God's satisfaction with a good will, independent of the material magnitude of the good deed to which it leads. Augustine frequently urges the importance of sharing resources with the poor. In a sermon at the beginning of Lent, for example, he goads his congregation to let the self-denial of one who undertakes it willingly become the support of the one who has nothing. Let the voluntary want of the person who has plenty become the needed plenty of the person in want, end quote. But in at least two sermons exhorting his congregations to exert their goodwill by renouncing greed and providing for the needy, Augustine clarifies that the crucial issue is not the quantity of the gift, but the kind of will with which one gives. Quote, do you want to be rich toward God? Give to God. Give not from vast resources, but from your own proper will. It doesn't mean, after all, that if you only give a little from the little that you have, what you give is only treated as being little. God doesn't weigh up people's resources, but their willingness. To drive home this point, Augustine repeatedly pairs Zacchaeus, who gave out of wealth, and the widow, who gave her might out of poverty. Augustine argues that they are equal in terms of will. Quote, compare the willingness of Zacchaeus and the willingness of the widow. You will find absolute similarity. What matters is not how much, but how willingly you give. Augustine links this principle with Jesus' promise of reward to those who give but a cup of cold water in his name. For Augustine, quantity of good works matters less than the quality of will. Another hopeful aspect of Augustine's preaching about human willing in the Christian life is his clear affirmation that progress is possible. Introducing a sermon on Psalm 39, he opens by emphasizing the importance of growth. Quote, it is the task of Christians daily, he says to his congregation, to make progress toward God. Augustine then exhorts his listeners to assess their advancement when each day is done. He encourages the faithful to look not only for progress over the long haul, but also to make some small advance each day. How does this apply specifically to good willing? In further developing his reading of the admonition of Luke 12 to reconcile with the adversary of your will, that is God's word on the way to court, Augustine urges that agreement be reached in this life. Quote, the road is this life. That is the road in the parable. If we have reached agreement with him, if we have given him our consent, then when the road reaches its end, we won't have to fear either judge, officer, or prison, end quote. The concrete examples Augustine provides, the will to get drunk, watch the games, commit adultery, suggests that Augustine believes this kind of reconciliation of our willing and God's word will be needed again and again as all manner of temptations arise. Augustine allows for long-term advancement as well as incremental quotidian improvements. In preaching about Philippians 3, 9 through 10, which mentions justice through the faith of Christ, 
justice that is obtained from God, to use the words of Augustine. He emphasizes that, quote, the whole thing is from God, and yet that justice cannot be in you apart from your will. Augustine then urges his congregation to continue growing in this justice from God manifested in human willing, not only from day to day, but over the years, seasons, and even epochs of life, from spiritual infancy to adulthood to the very point of perfection. Quote, let us hold on to this justification insofar as we have it, and let us grow in it insofar as we are still small and immature. And let us bring it to perfection when we arrive at the place where we shall say, where, death, is your victory, end quote. While perfection is clearly only to be attained in glory, even in this life, he indicates in Sermon 109, we can strive for growth that amounts to substantial transformation to reach a point where we encounter God, not just as the adversary of our will, but actually as a friend. For Augustine, loving is a subset of willing. And if there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends, there is perhaps no more difficult love than to love one's enemies. Yet such is Augustine's idealism about human willing in this life, that even this seemingly impossible Christ-like ideal turns out in the earnest exhortations of his preaching to be something he holds up as attainable in the here and now. Quote, exert yourselves, my dearest friends, to attain this perfection, I implore you. But is it I who have given you the capacity to do so? He has given it to you, the one to whom you say, thy will be done as in heaven, so also on earth. However, you mustn't assume it's impossible. I know, I have learned, I have satisfied myself that there are Christian people who love their enemies. If it seemed impossible to you, you would never do it. First of all, believe that it can be done and pray that God's will may be done in you. Here we see Augustine giving back by grace what he has taken away by nature. With all the urgency of a Pelagian, yes we can, recontextualized in a powerful theology and chronology of grace, Augustine the preacher cheers the faithful on so that they might not grow weary in doing good. Progress is possible, he insists, if we would but dismiss despair and cling to God. What are the conditions for the possibility of this progress? Augustine makes clear that God's assistance of our willing is required for us to make any progress at all. He observes in Sermon 156 that Christ, quote, didn't say, without me you can indeed do something, but it will be easier through me. He didn't say, you can bear fruit without me, but a better crop through me. That's not what he said. Read what he said, it's the Holy Gospel, treading on the proud necks of one and all. This isn't what Augustine says, it's what the Lord says. What does the Lord say? Without me, you can do nothing." End quote. For Augustine, we have it from the lips of the Lord himself. Grace does more than facilitate things as we act with a good will. It enables such action. More specifically, Augustine attributes any progress we make to Christ and the Holy Spirit. Though like the prodigal son, we may want to appropriate our inheritance of free will to ourselves, to use as we see fit. What we should do, Augustine says, is to acknowledge Christ, who wants to pour out into you what he's full of himself. Augustine also describes the Holy Spirit as pouring out in our hearts the love through which we will rightly and continuing to do this until we are made perfect in charity. In the words of one of Augustine's homilies, you simply must believe this, that this is how you act with a good will. You do good things in such a way that the spirit is your director and helper. Augustine urges his listeners in moments of weakness and weariness of will, such as those described in Romans 7, to cry out to God 
Augustine says, let him help you, let God help you with his spirit, end quote. If we ask in humble faith, echoing Paul, who cries out, who will deliver me from the body of this death? Augustine encourages, we can be confident that we will receive in response, quote, the truest answer there can be, the grace of God through Jesus Christ our Lord, end quote. Alongside his emphasis on our radical need for God's help, Augustine also underlines the freedom we do enjoy by grace to will the good. On more than one occasion, he observes that the Christian scriptures entail two aspects of the mystery of human willing in this life that must be held together. On the one hand, the Bible repeatedly enjoins action in accordance with God's commands. Such exhortations would be pointless did we not enjoy free will, thanks, of course, to God's grace in Christ. On the other hand, we also find dispersed throughout the scriptures prayers for and injunctions to pray for God's aid in doing good. These injunctions show that our willing on its own is insufficient. Augustine wants to avoid what we might dub a Horatio Alger fallacy, the idea that we can pull ourselves up on the spiritual bootstraps of our autonomous right willing. But he also urges his congregants to avoid the trap of complacency. Quote, whatever we are enjoined to do, we have to pray that we may be able to fulfill it, but not in such a way that we let ourselves go and like sick people lie flat on our backs and say, may God rain down food on our faces and we ourselves wish to do absolutely nothing about it. And when food has been rained down into our mouths, we say, may God also swallow it for us. <laughs> we too have got to do something. We've got to be keen. We've got to try hard and to give thanks insofar as we have been successful, to pray insofar as we have not, end quote. As this statement indicates, for Augustine, we need to respond actively to God's provision. And prayer not only indicates the insufficiency of our good willing on its own, it also, ironically, is one of the most powerful ways we have of exercising the agency that God does by grace accord to us. Repeatedly, Augustine tells his flock to ask God to help us will well. Prayer is not only a sign of our dependency, but a God-given means of spiritual strength. We can and should ask for a good will, even as our Lord himself did. And these prayers, Augustine preaches, do make a difference. To conclude, Augustine threw himself into the task of exhorting his flock towards right willing striving at once to acknowledge the harsh realities of the struggle to will rightly in this life and to remind his listeners of the many supports in place to ease their endeavors. Willing as a Christian in this life, he forewarned his flock, involves ongoing wrongful desires, continued deviation from the will of God, painful spiritual therapy, and disturbing internal conflict. On the upside, love lightens the load of right willing. God looks with favor on good intentions, no matter the result. Progress is within reach. And God in Christ and the Holy Spirit enables and fortifies good willing, even while granting us genuine agency in the process, not least of all through prayer. How? to these two disparate sides of the task of willing rightly relate. At the end of the day, which is it? Is willing rightly as a Christian, that is, under the auspices of God's grace, hard or easy? How does God's merciful assistance come to us? Does it come like March's lion or like April's lamb? Do we have to do with a stringent poultice, a kind of hard and inexorable mercy, to use Augustine's own words, or with a soothing salve 
Shakespeare's Portia from The Merchant of Venice offers an answer as unequivocal as it is renowned. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as a gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. At first glance, Augustine seems to have set up a starkly different alternative. Get up from your rest, we hear him admonish. We cannot simply lie there like sick people and say, may God rain down food on our faces. Where Portia praises unstrained mercy, Augustine preaches unsparing strain. We too have got to do something, he says. We've got to be keen. We've got to try hard. Yet Augustine's reign and Portia's may have more in common than at first meet CI. Augustine does at times describe God's merciful work on our willing as more of a driving downpour than a gentle spring shower, warning of the painfulness of God's prescribed courses of treatment and the rigors of what is expected for our response. But elsewhere, he's all mildness and receptivity and can use images akin to Portia's. Consider Sermon 131, where he writes, quote, it is God who is at work in you. Therefore, with fear and trembling, make a hollow, receive the shower. Depressions get filled, high places dry up. Grace is rain." End quote. In the end, for Augustine, God's mercy, like its most potent conduit, Jesus Christ acting through his Holy Spirit, when precipitated into the atmosphere of our daily lives, takes the form of lion and lamb together, of cold snow, stinging sheets falling heavy from the sky, and of the softness of a single glistening raindrop. Our experience of God's mercy at work in our willing in this life, and therefore the human art of willing, is itself a creation of Christ, and as such partakes in both his ferocity and his meekness. Thanks very much. I imagine we better stay socially distanced. We heard the exhortation from Jeffrey. So, um, but I don't think we need our masks up here if we're, okay. if we're like this. Is that okay? Everyone's okay with that? Because we can certainly put them on. Um, or whoever's not talking. Yeah, I guess, yeah, we can, we can do one of them. Well, thank you very much for, for your lecture. Um, and, uh, and by the way, microphone's here. Please, if you've got a question, please make your way to a microphone. And we've got some that have uh, uh, submitted some questions on Slido already. Uh, let me begin this way. Um, you know, let's, uh, let's ask Pastor uh, Augustine. Um, so he, these sermons, I, I like the fact that you know, you're pulling these sermons. Sermons are really situationally loca located and localized in a group of people. You're preaching to, you know, rather than sitting in your office and writing, right? So it's really existential. So if Pastor Augustine were here today, uh, what counsel would he give to those providing a teaching, preaching ministry to people with faces? And not just the social media realm, um, but to wrestle with some of these things. It seems like there's a, a, a tendency, temptation, we're either activists, we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna usher in the kingdom, or there's the quietist pacifist. And boy, we see it all over, don't we? And so what would, what would Pastor Augustine, what counsel would he have uh, for pastors and church leaders today? Yeah. Well, that's a great question, a very big one. I think um, in terms of thinking about what you mentioned at the start of your question, the situational character of preaching and 
the importance of responding to people in the room mm -hmm. who are physically present. Um, I think that we can learn a lot from both observing things that Augustine actually does as recorded in his sermon, mm -hmm. as well as from his theory of preaching mm -hmm. that he articulates elsewhere. Um, in his theory of preaching, he talks about how one of the most important tasks, well, he doesn't explicitly say this, but he says we should really pull out like the highest level of rhetoric, more grand rhetoric, when we're trying to persuade people to do something that they know is right, mm -hmm. but they don't, they don't want to do it. And at that point, we sort of launch into this, the, the best rhetoric that we have available to us. So he very much sees preaching as something that's aiming to move the listeners. And we can tell in his sermons from his actual practice that he's very carefully observing how people are responding and reacting accordingly. So he'll say things like, well, I hear you beating your chest, but what I really want is for you to mm -hmm. actually act it out. Or um, it seems clear also that if he's not persuaded that someone has understood something, he'll keep repeating it in a different way mm -hmm. until it really breaks through. So he really is keen to connect with people where they mm -hmm. are and help affect a kind of conversion in them, wherever they may be mm -hmm. in their Christian walks. And he's attuned to the cues that are that he's taking in mm -hmm. through his senses mm -hmm. as he's preaching to him about whether this connection is happening and what may be going on in the invisible hearts yeah. of his flock. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Matthew. In his preaching, um, it seems like a lot of the quotes you you used, he's he has like a sort of humor, kind of in the form of sarcasm at times. Uh, that seems he's using like to exhort his congregation. I'd love to hear your thoughts about the effectiveness of that kind of use, particularly in an age today with like widespread irony and and cynicism. If that kind of like sarcasm doesn't work anymore, or if you think. There's something there in the task of preaching that that still lands. Um, anyway, I'd just love to hear you talk yeah. about that. Oh, that's such a great question. Hmm. Yeah, I think um, so. My instinct is I, I do think there are some dangers of that kind of approach, but I think that we can learn from some of Augustine's own rhetorical techniques in in how he does this. I mean, he's very careful. Um, so. That is an immediate contrast that comes to mind when reading his preaching to today, at least the preaching context that I'm familiar with. There isn't a lot of direct calling out of the congregation. Like, I see you doing this, and this is terrible, and you should be doing this instead, um, which Augustine seems quite prepared to do. But he's also um, not, singling, not singling people out and he so it's a an imprecise you I guess mm -hmm. <laughs> which is helpful mm -hmm. um, and he also very much includes himself I think in um, he's preaching to himself as well mm -hmm. and I think that comes through in his sermons there's a recent article about um, his language of Christ the physician which is so common and um, this particular scholar Dorothea Weber is uh, examining well how do how do how do the priests relate to that are they seen as also physicians um, representing Christ and really her emphasis in that article is that uh, the priests tend to be seen as themselves patients in need of the healing of Christ mm -hmm. so I think that aspect of solidarity that really does come through in his preaching and his own vulnerability um, I mean, expressed in such works as the Confessions about his mm -hmm. own continued struggles with sin uh, probably makes it more palatable and would be perhaps a lesson for us today is that mm -hmm. he's not, he is preaching hard and challenging words, mm -hmm. but not as one who stands above mm -hmm. his flock in a self-righteous mm 
judgmental kind of way, but in a way that emphasizes his own solidarity with them in need for the grace of Christ. Um, I, think, I think that's one important aspect that, that makes it more uh, ac accessible, mm. hopefully. Very important lesson to learn, too. Uh, yes, please. Thanks. So I'm, I'm intrigued by this category of the, um, the non-culpable non-alignment of human and divine will, um, and somewhat perplexed and distressed by it, too. So it seems to me one thing to say, uh, you know, of someone, you know, that person's will is not aligned with God. They, you know, uh, rightly will the stability of life or something like that, even though, will, you know, God wills something else. It's another thing to sort of internalize that, you know. So, okay, I will life, but now I'm learning that that's not what God wills. Sort of what, I, what do I do with that? Um, so uh, Sharon Street, a uh, philosopher, has argued that um, theism leads to moral skepticism because I sort of look out at the world and I see, you know, oh, God did not intervene to prevent this, this ill or, you know, God must will all this nasty stuff. I don't, you know, but I guess I just don't know. <laughs> I, go, I don't know what to will. So, so it, ultimately, this is, I think, a pastoral question. You know, what, if, I, if I learn that my uh, uh, love of life is sort of not what God wills. <laughs> what, how then do I align my will with God's? Um, and what, ultimately, I think this is a question of, you know, consolation in the face of grief and confusion and loss and so forth. What would, what would Augustine say about the distress that results from that apparent unalignment of wills, however non-culpable? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it's a tricky one, too. I, his thinking about specifically the issue of um, death, which is, which is what was at stake in a lot of the examples I used, also changes over the course of his career. So early on, he, um, he really is of the view that we shouldn't, we shouldn't fear death at all, and that, um, yeah, he says the sage is kind of immune to that. But he, he changes his mind about that over time. And I think um, that also accompanies his thoughts on death and whether it's how to evaluate it, is it natural or not. So um, yeah, I think it's, it, there's a lot of complicated moving pieces. I think Jesus Christ, his struggle in Gethsemane is a significant paradigm here. But I don't know that there's like a really tidy philosophical um, account for that. I mean, he, so Augustine will talk about how even, this is another thing that's kind of, ooh, how do we think about this? Um, how initially Christ's own will is a little out of, al out of alignment with God's will for him. So what does, what does that mean? How do we make sense of that? Um, so yet, but Christ was certainly not sinful for Augustine. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure really how he would reconcile that, but it's something that, um, that he does affirm. And I suppose maybe there could be different, uh, different senses of God's will, perhaps, that one might distinguish between. Because in a sense, it is God's will that, you know, God's created design in Augustine's view for people to live and not to die, even though his immediate particular will for a person's life might be different from that. So perhaps there's, a, in that vein of, of thinking through different, um, different senses of God's will, there might be some way of working out some kind of resolution. That's the best I can do at this point. <laughs> uh, we've got a question here uh, that's been uh, submitted. Uh, Zach asks, given that habit, I'll take this off, given that habit is like a second nature whose force memory carries forward into the present, how do past sinful habits constrain even the graced will today? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
right? There, well, habit is an interesting theme in Augustine's thought. Uh, there was, so his thinking about habit evolves, and there was a time, I would say, so there, there is a time earlier in Augustine's thinking where for him, um, sin's grip is not so expansive as it becomes later, and mm -hmm. actually he accounts for that already at that phase in terms of habit. Mm. But then um, later on he thinks that sin, um, the hold it has on us is more than just a matter of discrete a actions that add up upon one another and layered together become habit. It's more of a problem that affects us on the level of nature. That's not to say he abandons them, the idea of habit, and that mm -hmm. it matters. It's just that's not as crucial or exclusive a category for describing what's going on. But he would, um, he would continue to think that habit is in effect, but just that that doesn't exhaust the nature of the problem, mm -hmm. I guess we could say that. Thank you. A uh, question here, please. Thank you, Dr. Conley. So you mentioned uh, prayer in the life of the baptized believer in the sanctification of the redeemed will. I'm wondering if you could add a little, or just mention briefly what role the Lord's Prayer has in Augustine's thought, or perhaps if it appears in his own preaching. Yes, great question. Um, so there's so much to say about this. Uh, all right, let's see. I guess three major things to say. Um, one is, so um, the Lord's Prayer takes on a huge significance in, in the Pelagian controversy for Augustine because he uses it to, it basically provides dominical uh, endorsement for his views of grace. He says, you know, why would we, why would we um, ask for, God's aid that his will might be done if we didn't need God's help, if we already had the natural wherewithal to do the right thing. Why pray about this? And then he draws on um, Cyprian, who in his own interpretation of the Lord's Prayer says some quite, quite Augustinian, to use an anachronistic descriptor, um, quite Augustinian sorts of things. And so he then used Cyprian's interpretation of the Lord's Prayer to invoke an added, really important African authority to support his anti-Pelagian views of grace. So on that level, like theologically, in the context of anti-Pelagian polemic, it's hugely important. And then also, um, the Lord's Prayer is, is um, something he talks about a lot in his sermons in this way as well, making similar points, so not so polemically directed. And one of the things he believes is that um, in contrast to Pelagians, to, to take things to a really practical everyday level of the Christian life, which I guess is mainly our focus today, um, is that he thinks Christians should be saying the Lord's Prayer daily, and that actually this is part of the way he describes progress in the Christian life in terms of this consistent prayer practice. And he, his point against Pelagius here is really that that daily, consistent, mundane, humdrum Christian practice of praying the Lord's Prayer is actually a more, more valuable kind of growth sometimes than something, a spectacular, more ascetic feat of renunciation. That's also something that he, he clearly says. So for him, it's... Um, it's important in a lot of different contexts, including in the, um, the life of the everyday Christian and in their, in their, in their transformation in a, in a pretty like, mundane kind of way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, here's another question that's been submitted <clears throat> from Dwight. The City of God is expanded a little bit beyond here, but the City of God was written in the fifth century in response to Christians being the problem, uh, which sounds a lot uh, very similar to what's happening today. And so the question then is, so what, what applications might there be from Augustine's thinking on that issue for our present time? Hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. So I think that there are some really striking parallels, I mean, um, between the situation Augustine is addressing in City of God and today, Christians being the problem, including being also part of it, perhaps. Um, I think a bit of the mentality that he's addressing, we might describe in terminology that's similar to maybe some of the slogans that we've heard today. Like some of the people that Augustine may be addressing are, their concern is, we need to make Rome great again. Mm -hmm. Like Rome, Rome, Rome has fallen on some really hard days. And like we need to get back to those glory days. And if we think about the difference between those glory days and now, like what, what's the problem? Well, Christians, like we haven't been faithful to the traditional Roman mm -hmm. gods. So what do we do about this? So I think that there are, um, there's this kind of uh, nostalgia mm -hmm. um, that, that Augustine is addressing, like a political nostalgia for a lost glory. And um, how to then connect that to the current context where sometimes built into that nostalgia are really complex understandings of how Christianity and say, the United States history are intertwined. I think it's, there might be some really fascinating analogies and disanalogies mm -hmm. there to explore, but mm -hmm. definitely a really intriguing line of thought, I yeah. would say. Thank you very much. Uh, next question, please. Yeah, th thank you so much. Um, this, this was really helpful and clarifying. Um, I guess my, my concern sort of maps on to the earlier question asked about the mismatch of uh, God's will and human willing. Um, namely that in the city of God, Augustine's also addressing a lot of victims of rape and sexual assault. And I guess part part of my, there's kind of a twofold worry I have with Augustine's response of saying, um, it's okay to have your will mismatched so long as you recognize this is the will of God. Um, and, you know, you're, but don't get angry at, at God. I, I both worry what that does to someone psychologically and spiritually to internalize that this is the will of God and I just, uh, my, my discomfort is okay, but it's his will. And then I guess the second part of that would be, is there, is there space in Augustine's theology to cry the cry of dereliction on the path to hope um, rather than as a, as a rebellious statement against God? Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe I'll address the first part about city of God first. Yeah, I think, um, I think there is a, um, a legitimate concern here about, about quietism and whether Augustine's view might sometimes lend itself to just saying, you know, sorry that this terrible thing happened to you, but, you know, it's all for the best. <laughs> um, and there is a notorious section in the City of God where Augustine seems to be taking that sort of line to some virgins who have been raped and saying, you know, well, maybe God intended this for, you know, uh, trying to sort of provi provide a positive interpretation of this horrible event. Um, at the same time, I think that the way Augustine uses the idea of willing in relation to God's will, um, it's maybe more, there's more going on there than just that, like a critique along the lines of what I just said would fully get at. And I think if we think about like another part of the city, in, city of God, if we think about um, Lucretia and how he deals with her case and comparing that to say how like the, Livy would address her situation, we see more, um, we see the, positive side of his whole approach to things. I mean, for him, the fact that Lucretia's rape happened against her will um, is means that she's not to blame in any way. And then he actually goes on to say that her, um, her suicide is, was therefore wrongful and should not be praised by the Romans because then she's, she's paying a penalty for something she never even did. So um, 
in that case, then it's not like we can see how his thought doesn't have to lead to the conclusion that, um, though he might say, you know, God could still bring something good about good out of this. It doesn't mean, well, then just glory in all the negativity mm -hmm. of what's going on. You know, um, this he's not trying. He the fact that he will then say she shouldn't have committed suicide says that she shouldn't. Uh, it, just because God might use bad things that happen to us for the good doesn't mean that they them th those things themselves are mm -hmm. God's good. God's will for say Lucretia. So he praises her. Or he <laughs> no he 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 says that it would be praiseworthy for someone to then resist and say no. This does not. This is not something that I should just acquiesce to all this bad stuff that's happening to me. I, I need to resist it. So I think there is like a kind of paradigm for in his thinking about human willing in the case where someone has been um, very seriously mistreated. There's a kind of case for actively resisting that dangerous pattern and extricating oneself from that situation. I think of like Maybe a contemporary situation today might be domestic violence or something like that. So I can understand where the concerns are coming from, but I think that if we dig deeper, there are also resources in Augustine's thinking for addressing some of those. OK. Thank you. Uh, here, please. Hello. Thank you so much for your lecture and your book. It was wonderful. Um, my question is, I guess when I um, think about creation and Augustine's will, like, can you explain how Augustine thinks about creation and human humanity's will? Because it seems like at times that it's kind of like an ex nihilo of the will in hum humanity, maybe, or even in, uh, maybe angels, right? They have a good will, but yet when they're turned towards bad, but nothing causes that turns towards bad except for desire. Is that correct? If you could please explain that. <laughs> OK. Um, yeah, I think whew, so a couple things to say might be um, explaining his. So Augustine's doctrine, his, his view of how willing uh, was created to function would be very different from, from what I've been discussing today. It's a whole other paradigm, so to speak. So uh, the will as created would have been um, enjoyed a a much greater freedom, um, a freedom to, to do right, as well as a freedom that was then taken advantage of to do what was wrong. So it's a totally different mm -hmm. context, and there are different rules of the game, so to speak, for how that created will works. With respect to the will, uh, well, OK, I think you were touching on the issue also of uh, like where did the, where, <laughs> how did things go wrong, and how do we account for that? That, I, I mean, Augustine says on the free choice of the will that, yeah, there was this turning towards evil, but really there, there is no explanation in his view that we can provide for that. So uh, I'm not sure that we can get too much farther on that. Um, and as for the ex nihilo piece, I think that's where there's this, your question is so great because I think the, there is a kind of analog in the Christian life under grace with, subsequent to the fall, where the rules of the game are totally different to the created will in that Augustine constantly, he uses this language of recreation so that even in the Christian life, there's this sense in which we are, are willing. Um, it, doesn't all, it, there, it doesn't come from a direct antecedent in our good willing a direct antecedent necessarily in us. It's, um, it's, it is, he talks about it, like a creation ex nihilo by Christ. And that's what makes it grace, because there really is no explanation in terms of anything we've done to deserve it, but that we are we're dependent on this, these radical acts of recreation to will, will rightly, even in the Christian life. Thank you, Jeffrey. Hang on just a moment, because I think we've got a follow-up uh, that's been submitted. 
uh, about the will again, and, and Bill asks, in a culture in which the nature versus nurture debate sidesteps our human capacity to will, how does Augustine help us provide a robust, if nuanced, account? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's a hard question to answer because I think it, it all really depends on um, the, the particular circumstance we're thinking about for Augustine. So mm -hmm. um, I think I could say that uh, for, with respect to Christians, I think he would be fairly optimistic mm -hmm. about what could be accomplished via nurturing, mm -hmm. at, given like a rehabilitation of the will that can't always be presupposed among those who aren't Christians. That said, he does allow for um, a kind of uh, version of, of, of good works, even among people who are, who are not, not Christian. There are works that are good sort of in themselves, even though they're not referenced ultimately to love of God. So for the best kind of nurture, like the ideal form of nurture that is truly good, that is oriented towards nurturing people in the love of God, Augustine would say that's really going to require God's grace and mm -hmm. be possible only through the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. acting in a person. But there could also be a kind of nurturing that leads to goods that are good in a more immediate kind mm -hmm. of way in themselves. Um, yeah, I guess I'll okay. leave it at that, yeah. that, yes. that for now. Thank you. Jeffrey. First, uh, <clears throat> first Dr. Concert come on. Uh, just a, um, a word of affirmation. Your, your talk did a remarkable job, I think. Of, it showed that you have read so widely in Augustine Psalms, and yet you presented it to us without showing all the work that you did. So a, a twofold affirmation. Thank you for showing us um, mm -hmm. Augustine Psalm uh, sermons in that way. My question for you is a little downstream of the lecture, but sort of mainstream creation project. We're about science engaged theology. Mm. Um, often, Augustine, on the one hand, is sort of uh, so influential in the development of Christian accounts of the human uh, from a Christian tradition perspective. It seems things like Enneagram are perhaps more influential in contemporary culture, psychology, biology, are more how we think about uh, what it means to be human. So if you were to sort of speak on behalf of Augustine on what he offers us today on what it means to be human and how he might contribute to interdisciplinary conversations, um, what, what insights come to mind? Hmm. Well, I think there probably would be a lot of uh, different ways of answering that question. My mind's going in a couple different directions, so I guess I'll just um, share with you what those are. I mean, um, in terms of what it means to be human, I think that for Augustine, we are creatures made to worship God, and for him, worship um, is about as he describes his mother Monica, uh, hearing from God and speaking to God, this conversation, this living, dynamic, relational conversation between us and God. And so I think that's at the heart of his understanding of, of what it means to be human. I think that, um, that confession's the first line, at that mm -hmm. line, says so much that's really what we're here to declare in our in our words and in our actions great are you lord and greatly to be praised like to, praising praising god as he seeks to do in that work that's it's really what human life is all about for him um as opposed as as for um interdisciplinary conversations Wow. Well, he, I think he has a pretty, uh, pretty distinctively, my take would be a pretty distinctively Christian understanding of, of um, who human beings are and what they're made to do. And 
So insofar as good inter interdisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity isn't about watering things down, but about uh, digging into distinctives, I think that he could, Augustine would be a way of getting at a um, really intense and beautiful um, understanding of what it means to be human that's at the heart of the Christian tradition and has been really influential. And um, that might be a great starting point for, for conversation. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Joel, we may give you the last question. All right, thanks so much for the lecture, it was wonderful. Um, I'm curious about how Augustine's mature theology on predestination, you know, when uh, he's continually emphasizing the perfect efficacy of the divine will, you know, God, um, so like chapter 96 and following of uh, the Incredian, when he keeps saying over and over and over and again, our God is in heaven, he does whatsoever he wills, you know, and, and uh, the Almighty would be impotent if humans could resist him. Does that ever come up when in the more pessimistic passages about the ability of the Christian to overcome sin? Because it seems like there's some tension there, right? Because on the one hand, the, the divine will is perfectly effectual. God gets what he wants. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, there's these texts that say, hey, Christians don't sin. Um, what is it about our status as fallen humans that it looks like the divine will isn't perfectly efficacious over here in the instance of humans attempting to overcome sin? Does that, is, that, is that just a tension there, or how does he deal with those two aspects of his mature theology? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I think one, one aspect of, so you mentioned like the uh, issue of whether someone can resist, can resist God's will or not. Um, I think there's a difference between what he says about the Christian life and about um, the will and how it's going to be working before this influx of the Holy Spirit in a person's heart. So that in, in the realm of the fall, at least, um, we're going to be totally incapacitated. Um, but then in the Christian life, I guess the question you're asking is, why would it be that we're not doing good all the time, since presumably that's what God would want, right? Um, yeah, I think that perhaps, I don't know, it might have something to do with um, just God allowing us a kind of freedom in, in the Christian life to, um, to deliberate. Because once again, we are in this situation where we're not in the thrall of evil. We, c we can choose the good. So... At this point, God is giving us some latitude <laughs> to, to either act rightly or not. Um, but I think at the end of the day, there's a lot of, there's a lot at least that for me remains unresolved as far as what to do with these matters of divine and human agency and mm -hmm. how they can both be operative and effective at the same time. And I. I do think that Augustine does hold on to um, an idea that that our effort and what we do and our agency does matter and is is somehow efficacious, uh, somehow on a different plane than than what God is doing, um, so that they're not in competition with one another, but both working together it's for the nitty gritty as to how that gets worked out. I don't know. Maybe subsequent 
Yeah, it's something that keeps being worked on in the tradition and secondary causality, things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's a, yeah, don't, don't know that we, that we have it quite figured out, but yeah. Thank There's you. Let's uh, thank Dr. Conlon again. <laughs>